I was going to read you all of the bios of the wonderful panelists, but they're so long that it would take me 15 minutes because they're so wonderful. So what we're going to do is just go around and let the panelists introduce themselves and maybe say a few thoughts about what they just watched. Um, so let's just go ahead and start. Let's do uh, Bronwyn. You actually, you let's let Bronwyn introduce. Okay, thank you, Angie. And I'm going to let you introduce because the guy is cutting my line right now. If you all can hear that background noise, but I can't it, hear it. Yeah. Can't. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Now I can. Now I can. Yeah, because he's like right outside the window now. Oh, no. Okay. Well, to save you for <laughs> so, last. I, no, I, I'm going. He's oh, okay. Pulled away. Great. Great. Okay. Okay, um, welcome everybody. I really appreciate my panelists for um, uh, stepping up to the plate today and, and coming on and having this great discussion because it's a very important discussion. Um, as you can see, my name is Bronwyn and I am the founder of 313 Network Solutions and 313 Network Solutions has been a dream of mine for about 15 years, ever since um, I came out of a of prison incarceration for a mental health crisis that I had that was medicated related. Um, and I'll talk more about that later on as we go along and explain. Um, so yes, and if you don't mind, I think Angie kind of asked earlier, if you can put in the chat box to uh, all the panelists or to all attendees where you're from so I can kind of see where people are from and, and um, you know, get an idea on that. And with that, I'm going to introduce Cheryl. Cheryl is an amazing peer support specialist and I'm gonna let her tell her, her story. Well, tell pieces until we can get into it. Thank you. Okay, so I, I've uh, been a certified peer support specialist since 2011 and currently a community advocate educator. Um, and just a brief, my brief experience is I was, um, went to help for help for anxiety over 20 years ago and uh, my cycle of medication started. And I'm currently in protracted withdrawal. Um, and I could talk for hours about it, but I'm not, you know, we'll get to that with the other questions, maybe. Thank you, Cheryl. And I'm going to let um, Cindy share her journey um, with her son. So I'm uh, Cindy Fisher from Vancouver, Washington. Um, I have four children. My oldest is 43 years old, and that's the one who has been at the intersection of two oppressions, both racism and psychiatric oppression. And um, his, his journey actually started with a very extreme racist act that maybe I will go into later um, when he was 12, right after he took the SIT, John Hopkins University, um, chose him and some others in our state to take the SAT. And he was in a very racist white school. And um, that led to a very extreme act that later impacted him so that at age 17, um, he ended up um, being coerced to see a psychiatrist who gave him a um, prescription for a experimental psychiatric drug that I later found out was a thousand percent above the recommended dosage. So for me, that's where racism comes in. Um, I, had he, I think, been white, she may have given a smaller, lesser dose um, that still would have been destructive, but the um, thousand percent above change the course of his life. Yeah. Thank you, Cindy. And I'm going to go over here to Johanna and Galen and let them share briefly why they wanted to come on and, and share um, their experience um, around medicating normal. What's that been like for them? Um, I, I, bet I was uh, taking medicine since I've been 21 and I'm 53 now. And uh, what I never realized is that 
I may, I may have never known it, but I'm not alone in this. And uh, I was always, I always believed that I was it, nobody else. And uh, now being a peer that I am, I'm not alone. There are many of us. How about introducing yourself? Oh, Galen Atkins. How you doing? <laughs> Galen. Hi, <laughs> Galen. <laughs> my, name is, Thank you. my name is Johanna Nicolia Adkins, and I'm a social worker as well as a certified peer support specialist and a community health worker. And I'm also his wife. So we have a, a very dynamic or um, unique situation here where we're both certified peers and our experiences with and without medication um, have been very challenging at times. So it, I'm, I'm honored to be on this panel, a little nervous. So hopefully we'll get through this with very little pain and I'm here to help keep him calm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to kind of jump over here. Um, if you like to bring on, bring yourself on camera, would you please just raise your hand and um, Angie and the team will put you on camera. It would be great for me. Um, when I'm talking and having discussions, I like to see who I'm talking to, you know, um, and I would appreciate seeing these beautiful faces and smiling faces of all the people that have come in to join us. Um, and I want to say right now, um, a special uh, thanks to, uh, and I don't want, I'm going to, I don't want to mess up your name, um, but it's a, a, a person that's joining us from India. Um, and there's some stuff in the chat box about, you know, their journey with medication. And I appreciate you being here and being open about it and um, moving on. My journey started with mental health diagnosis around um, back to like Cindy was talking about, um, I was about 12 or 13. Um, and my first actual startation, start on medications were around 17. Um, and as I moved on, um, my last, my, what ended me in prison was Prozac. And we talked, they just talked about Prozac in the film. Um, and my diagnosis had been major reoccurring depression. Um, no one ever looked at the, uh, the, the neglect or the abuse and the different things that had went on in my life as a child and the childhood experience that I had that caused me to have PTSD. No one talked about that. Um, and I went from the minimum 20 doses to 80 doses milligrams, which is the most within like a four month period, which just caused me to be very agitated. Um, little did I know um, not to call turkey. Well, I called turkey and that sent me into a mania because I had not been diagnosed with bipolar. So that sent me into a mania, very aggressive. Um, long story short, someone almost died. Um, Michigan doesn't, I had a choice, either declared mentally ill and go into the psychiatric hospital. And then when I get better, go back in front of the judge um, and, and have a trial or just go ahead and do the trial and do the time. So it's like, okay, we can lock you up for 20 years and then bring you back and sentence you and put you back for 20 more years. So I just took it and said, okay, I'm not going mental health. I'm not going to go that way. Um, I went, they sentenced me. I've never been in trouble. No prior. They gave me 10 to 20 years in prison. Going into the prison system in the Wayne County Jail, they put me on Klonopin. And I was on Klonopin for nine months. No one told me that I was going to have to be weaned off of that medication. Um, that was, I think, the light bulb moment to, after 20, 30 years of medication that they, they don't know what they're doing. Um, and during the midst of that, they were trying to put my son on Ritalin and he's already had a temper 
he already was agitated. So to put him on Ritalin would have made him even more explosive because that's one of the side effects, but no one told us. Um, and again, I think in the black community and, and hopefully Cindy may talk about it a little bit more. Um, that's the first, we, we as black people, we, we definitely have a lot more stress. We have a lot more trauma. There's unfortunately a lot more substance use in our, our communities. There's a lot more drugs. The children, unfortunately, are a lot more neglected or abused or having just having to survive. Um, and they talked about it in the film about, Angie talked about how she was medicated to not feel her feelings. The mom of the young lady talked about how um, we have all these children out here and we're teaching them not to deal with their feelings, to medicate their feelings. And that happens too much in our black communities um, when we seek help, when we seek help. Because a lot of times we don't seek help because we don't trust the system because all the experiments they've been doing on black people for decades, like the Tuskegee Airmen and a few others. So with that, I'm going to um, let someone else talk. And we, we do have a question. Um, Andy, did you want me to handle the questions? Are you gonna handle the questions or how you wanna do this? Yeah, I'll do. I'll go ahead and uh, handle the questions. First, I want to look. I want to go to Stephanie Lake. I see that you're a little upset, and I was wondering if you'd like to share anything. Oh, you got to unmute yourself though. And trust Hi. me, being <laughs> upset is a good response. It's normal. So, oh, so please don't don't hide those tears. You know. So, um, I've been medicated on and off since I was 17, but the past seven years, um, just been tried tons of meds. Um, I was on one that I was doing okay on for a couple of years, but okay isn't like great. It was um, effects or, and I felt like I could like handle things, but I feel like during all that, I, I'm off of meds now since March 29th. Um, a rapid taper and Lexapro was the most recent one, but they were causing like rapid heart rates, like all these crazy, you know, anxious suicidal thoughts. And I decided I'm an RN and I decided, you know what, these are side effects too, that, you know, I, I figured it out myself that it was probably the drugs that were causing these problems. So it's just been I don't even, I'm not working right now. I'm on long-term disability. Um, I don't even know where I fit in that world anymore because I don't believe in it. Um, Thank you for sharing, Stephanie. Yeah. You're, I just want you to know your vulnerability. It just, and to say that I'm an RN and I'm suffering from withdrawal, it's huge. It's huge. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I just, well, I'm scared. I'm scared of like, I, I have some support, but I'm scared of going back and they're going to be like, well, no, this isn't withdrawal anymore. It's been too long. You know, this is you and you need to get back on more meds. And how do you tell? I was, I was typing a question, but it deleted when um, you added the picture. But how do you tell what is you and what is, you know, if it's been so long and what is the withdrawal? Cheryl, would you like to answer that? I think you might be the best. Yeah, you got me in tears here. My heart goes out to you. Um, I will say it's, I know it's gotta be hard for you for tapering rapidly. Um, I did that with my antidepressant. Um, I, my journey with the antidepressants for, for over 20 years was one after the other, after the other, because they were actually making me have suicidal ideations. Um, they weren't helping me and I was adding other things, other things. It wasn't until I stopped taking them that I was able to look outside and see where my normal thoughts were, that the thought patterns I had were not me prior to. Um, going off of them rapidly, my heart goes out to you. I, I started a rapid uh, withdrawal with my benzo and 
almost went on a medical leave. And I, it was actually a person in my support group that told me you're going through benzo withdrawal and had me reinstate. Um, even going slow, it's difficult. Um, do you have support groups or anything like that? I'm on surviving antidepressants and that's helped me when I don't go too crazy with the researching. Sometimes right. it's too overwhelming, but. My advice to you is it's, it is time. And I, and I'm, I've been told this many times when I was in the group, it takes a lot of time. People want to go as fast as they can, but the slower you go, the better. Um, and, and the body takes a long time to heal. Um, you know, I, 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 I can't say I know what you feel, but I understand what you're feeling. And I'll, I'll just add, I would highly suggest, I'll put it down here in the chat, but every Saturday at one o'clock on Facebook, there's an inner compass conversations group and it's people that have been through withdrawal. I even host some of the talks sometimes, but uh, we talk about things like neuro emotions where, which is a term from surviving antidepressants that like, because the chemical has been in your brain and then you come off of it, you just completely go haywire. Everything goes in completely nuts. You can't, you don't even know it's you anymore. You know what I mean? I, I went through it. I see myself in you as you talk. And it's so scary and confusing because you're like, I know I'm not, I don't want to die, but why am I having these thoughts? You know? So my, I mean, I, what helped me get through this was holding on to, it's going to take a long time. This is not you. Your chemicals are going crazy. You can't tell what's real and what's not just stay with the peer support. We're going to talk about peer support in just a second. Stay with the peers that have been through it. They understand we've, you know, we've been through it and we're coming through the other side. It, it's just hard and it's emotional and it's extremely painful and it's suffering that no human being should have to endure, especially at the, when you, all you wanted to do was get help. You know, I have this depression or anxiety and I just wanted help. And now I have to, now I need more help and they can't even give me the help I need. So it's a lot of betrayals. It's a lot of trauma, secondary trauma. If, if you're a person of color, it's a third trauma, a fourth trauma, you know? So just hang in there, Stephanie. And I just so appreciate you being here. I, I would like to um, add um, at some point, um, I think that the damage becomes between the trauma of the medication and then um, if you get hospitalized, the dehumanization and abuse that happens in the hospital is a, a trauma upon trauma upon trauma. And if you are a black person of color, the medication that's given is at much, much higher doses. It becomes uh, the actual harm in the brain becomes so much that it's almost, I'm finding that it's almost impossible to stop the cycle. My son will get out he will immediately stop the drugs and he may have been locked up for six months or a year and there's nothing that you can tell him. And he's actually does pretty good for considering for about four months, but then, and I just found this was confirmed statistically about four months into it, he will start self-medicating to deal with, and he doesn't say it's to deal with the withdrawal, but I'm, I'm relatively sure it is. And then the self-medicating with alcohol and street drugs, along with the withdrawal from the chemicals, um, increases the behavior that will, again, get him locked up. So my sense is like um, the woman who says she has a support group, we, we need more than that out here. We need things like soteria houses. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it was the alternative to hospitalization um, and respite houses, which are not under the medical model because people, some folks just say, I'm not gonna to continue to poison myself no matter what. And we don't have the support out here. I used to be able to, I, advocated um, kind of against the system for seven or eight years and was able to actually get a few folks out of the hospital. But because of the lack of support, real support in the community, 
not just people support, but places to go, or sanctuaries and that. Um, my son's been recycled in and out of hospitals now for 20 years and it's devastating. Um, but there is hope on the horizon because there's now um, an international group of people um, that want to bring Soteria back. Soteria actually existed in the United States in 1970. It's S-O-T-E-R-I-A. Um, and it was started by the head of the National Institute of uh, Mental Health, the schizophrenia department. He felt that there should be an alternative to hospitalizations and medicalization, and he wanted to prove it. And um, he was given money to do a research project. He was hoping to put one in every state. They gave him enough to do one in California, um, but the success was phenomenal. They had the same success rate, the control rate, control, control group, uh, when a, someone between the ages of 18 and 24 came in with their first psychosis and, and were severe and they would be hospitalized, the next one that came in and was severe would go into this residential like home. And it's not like an adult family home. It was, it was like a healing sanctuary, like meet you where you're at, not what's the matter with you, but you know what's, what's going on, what happened. And um, they had the same success rate in six weeks that the people that were highly drugged and hospitalized without, I think they ended up 20% of the people in the house may have needed drugs, 80% over that 10 year period that the house existed um, were not drugged. So that's my hope is that like, yeah, we know the drugs are bad. Yeah, we know hospitalization overall can be very abusive. We need to create a different world out here to help the millions of people and now children and babies that are um, being exposed to these brain damaging. Neuroleptics means damage to the neural system. That's why they don't even call it neuroleptics anymore. They call it antipsychotics. But when they came out, they were called neuroleptics or the alternative to, um, what was it when they used to operate on your brain? Lobotomy. Lobotomy. Yeah. Lobotomy. When they first came out, they were called the chemical lobotomy. And then they marketed and remarketed and remarketed the term. So now they're antipsychotics. And they're not, they're the tranquilizers that destroy the brain. While we're kind of on this topic before shifting to peer support, I just want to bring up for Bronwyn and Cindy, you kind of touched on it, Cindy. What I find like doing these panels and trying to find people of color to speak about the medication issue, it is extremely hard to find people of color. And I think it's multifaceted. I think one, that the people of color are afraid of the white authority of psychiatry and mental health. Two, if they take meds, they're probably, there's some shame involved and they don't want to come out and talk about that. Three, they get stuck in the system so they can't even get to be an advocate. Yes, all, all, all three, all three, um, all three. Um, my experience has been, um, because when I first started seeing, seeking uh, mental health treatment, like I said, I was about 12 or 13, I didn't tell my parents um, because of the shame of that in our community. Um, because there's there's this thing that has went on two-sided. Two, two For one, we've had all these experimental things. Like we had the Tuskegee Airmen with the syphilis. We had Henrietta Lacks, when they took all her, they took her cells and started trying to make cancer drugs. And just the oppression of the black population for so long, we have not trusted white society because of the oppression of the of America to us. So we have for generations have been taught, you're stronger than that pull yourself up by the bootstraps, all of those things. You're stronger than that. That doesn't happen in our family. That doesn't happen. And we tend to have taken our, our, our and, and the sad part about it is 
families have kind of broken apart. But back a long time ago, we would wrap around our sick family member. Um, our uncle Charlie, who may have um, may have been having signs of schizophrenia, we would wrap around that person and kind of isolate them in the household, you know, and, and keep them at home um, so that the neighbors didn't know or people didn't know, or we would pray it away because that was an answer to a lot of different things too. So when it happened to me, and I'm sitting in the county jail facing a life sentence for attempted murder. And I ta finally talked to my dad about it, well, my family about it. He told me I didn't know what I was talking about. There was nothing wrong with me, okay? But I've been struggling for 25 years in silence with depression. Um, which and then later diagnosed as bipolar disorder. While I was incarcerated, my son started to exhibit schizophrenia symptoms. He was talking to himself. He was having hallucinations. He was seeing, you know, people that was not there. Um, and I was incarcerated, and I begged my family to take him to the crisis center. And they did not. What they did was they put him on the street. He became homeless. He was 21. And because it's such a stigma in our, our community that we don't talk about, he ended up being murdered by a 15-year-old who just wanted to, ex and excuse my expression, but this is what was in the police report. The kid said, we just wanted to fuck up the homeless man. And my son was murdered at 21. He never got any help because our community, because of the fear of what goes on. And if someone said it in the, in the, the young lady said when her husband called her on the phone and said he was standing next to a noose and she asked about his safety plan. And she said, she told him he should call 911. In the black community, we don't call 911 for a lot of reasons. For one, you, you fear for your life because if you're in an agitated state, um, whether you have a weapon or not, you are automatically a threat to the police because you're black. And many of us end up dead. Two, I would not call the police because of the fact that, and, and I've had this conversation with my daughter when she's having challenges, she would not seek psychiatric help because she was afraid that the system would come in and take her children and they would end up in foster care. That was her fear. And I used to have to tell her, fortunately that never happened to me, um, but it did happen when I went to prison. My children didn't go into foster care, but they went they were all separated by family members, you know, and the trauma of being separated, you know, was huge to them. And eventually, like I said, I think a lot of this led to my son's actual mental health break, you know, the trauma of them, him watching the police pin his mother down and take her off and tell her she's locked up and she's not coming home. How do you tell that to a, what do you tell a 13 year old kid who all he has is a mom and now they, you, we just violently snatched her out. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's a, all of those layers of, of, of issues why us as black people don't step up and tell our stories. Um, the shame, the guilt and the fear. Bruno, and I want to add one more. And I, I think your story is unfortunately such a perfect, if you have a perfect example of a, the oppression, the horror stories um, living here in America as a Black family. But the other piece is because, see, I was coerced into taking my son to a psychiatrist. I tried looking everywhere 
because I didn't want to take him to a psychiatrist and actually was told not to by some um, African wisdom um, kind of doctor from the African wisdom tradition. And um, I was forced to take him. And uh, that's one of the biggest regrets of my life. Um, I took him there. Uh, the psychiatrist took 30 minutes to diagnose a young man who had all kinds of trauma, including the 12 year one. And actually she didn't even uh, ask him anything about what's happening. She bribed him into accepting this uh, prescription that was for Resperidone which became the object of a lawsuit by multiple states and the federal government and Washington state ended up with $22 million because this was an experimental drug. It was not FDA approved for adolescents and minors. And then she did what many psychiatrists do today is because you're black and especially because you're a male, we need to make sure we disable you and they gave him the adult maximum dose he had never had psychiatric drugs in his life and in the next six months when he started self-mutilating himself giving himself a third degree huge burn on his arm because he wanted to feel something the man in the movie that talked about not being able to feel emotions you you just for many become totally numb inside. He gave himself a third degree burn. He, had, he begged me at age 17 after taking these drugs to stay in his bedroom one night because he was afraid he was going to jump out of the second story window, talking about suicidal thoughts. And then he gave, he tried to not seriously slit his wrist, but enough to try to call attention. And six months later, when we're in the emergency room because he's in such pain, the emergency physician tells my son and me, and that was the night after I stayed with him all night and he was so afraid he was gonna jump out of the window and was in such pain. When we went into the emergency room, the doctor looks at his chart and says, oh, you have a mental illness. And he looks at me right in front of my son and says, don't bring him in here again. You can't come running in here every time he has a, a hallucination or something about being in pain. And he sent us out the door. And within a month, my son had a complete, not a psychotic break. I believe he had a complete toxicity break from that medication because I didn't know it was so. And it started his quote, criminal career because he tried to get away from us who he thought was poisoning him with cyanide. Mm. And he went to get help at the neighbor's house and we were in an all white neighborhood and he's knocking on doors, trying to get help. Nobody answered. So he breaks a window knowing that that will get the help he needs. He goes to the street, stumbles in the street, collapses. The police arrive. He says, take me to the hospital because I'm dying from being poisoned and they take him to jail. Okay. And six months later, he ends up at the state hospital through the jail. And he tells him very specifically, cause he thinks that maybe he's gonna get help. He knows something's not right. He doesn't know what, but maybe there's a help. He talks about that racist incident at 12 o'clock. He talks about a sexual assault that happened less than a year earlier that should have been mandated reported. He talked about his parents divorcing and they diagnosed him as not having any stressors except not having enough money to be independent from his parents. And that has led to a lifelong treatment. So I kind of have a different position about trying to get us to get help until there's really real help out there. I, I, I agree, Cindy. And I, and I can relate to your, your, your story about, about your son and the first time they coerced you into treatment because the same son that I'm talking about is the son that they tried to put on Ritalin when he was 12. 
And okay. I refused to let them put on him on Ritalin. And he, what they called a behavioral problem. This, Obstinate not, defiance. That's yes. a disorder in yes. that book that they talk about. This young man was an honor roll student. And what it is, is we, we educate in this country country, everybody is in the same box. We educate everybody the same way. The lesson plan is as goes. Well, this was a child that if you gave him the information the first time, he's already got it. So while you're still having someone else who learns a little differently than him, you're trying to support them. This kid is sitting here idle and bored. So he's getting into trouble. Yeah. He's getting into trouble. He's he's making noises. He's 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 telling jokes. He's the class clown or troublemaker. Mm -hmm. But he has straight A's. Thank you. So but he's getting into this all this trouble. So he's constantly being kicked out of school. Mm -hmm. Okay. They label it as ADD. Right. But it's not ADD. He learns differently from these other students. He's already learned the lessons that you're still trying to teach. Three days later, you're still trying to teach people. And he's got it the first time around. Yeah. So he's learned it differently. But when they tried to put him on that Ritalin, I looked at the lady and I don't know what was wrong with me at the time, but she got a whole bunch of illicit expert lids out of my mouth when she told me that she wanted to put my child on Ritalin, you know, because somewhere in my system, I knew that that was not the answer for what right. was going on with him, medicating him. And then when I looked up Ritalin, it makes him more explosive. This was a kid that was already, he was, he was angry. He was already traumatized. He had a father who was in prison. He had a stepfather who was a drug addict. He had a grandfather who was a drug addict. This kid had trauma. I didn't know what trauma was back then, but he didn't need medication. And he, he also trauma. had inherited trauma. What do they call that? I mean, there was a reason for all the self-medication and everything else that you're, we, we call them drug addicts, but I like to refer to self-medication because there is so much trauma-induced environment in our society, depending on what ism that you have to carry. You're right. You know? And so he's got all of that. Plus now he's living in, you know, a trauma environment. And, and that's the piece that we have to create the alternative because the answer is 20%, it may work for our kids. And, and this is in general, maybe drugs, small amounts, maybe short time, maybe a few long-term, but if we don't create the alternatives in our community, if we keep relying on having to go to them the way it's set up now, we're gonna lose them in their drug-induced social control system, like my son, 13 times in the state hospital, 20 times in hospitals around the country. You know, and I'm trying to get him out now, but where? What is here? Yeah. He well, yeah. Let's use that as a segue to kind of shift okay. to peer support. But yeah. I want to, before we move on, I want to say, um, kind of what you're saying is what the theme of the film is, right? We have we have reactions to real life circumstances, to society, to poverty, to oppression, to racism, to trauma, to domestic violence, to being forced to sit in a desk for eight hours a day with no recess. We have reactions, we have symptoms, we have behaviors, and those are seen as illness instead of a normal reaction to something that's happening in your life. Absolutely. So I just Absolutely. want to put a, put a little pin in that because that's basically what you said. But then when you enter the system, you become a chronic patient. Yes. Because everything is seen as the illness. Okay, so let's <laughs> segue over to peer support. So does that mean peer support is a good alternative to the system? If so, why or why not? Let's do Galen and uh, Johanna. Go ahead. You want me? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Go sorry ahead. about that. Um, <laughs> peer support to me is um, not only can I relate to the young ladies and the other people within the system that have mental illness, 
it's also that the story that I carry is I did drop medication one time and I did go through those withdrawals and, and I didn't need medication when I was at a younger age until I was 21. So there was a period of my time that I didn't need medication and then I did. And there's a time that I want off my medication, which he can explain that there is times that I skip it and I'm a totally different person. Um, when you, when you think about the hospitals and all that there, I have firsthand experience of being in the state hospital, being at Pine Rest and other hospitals and throughout the system for a long time. Um, I know what it's like to have uh, learning disabilities and stuff like that, but that doesn't give me the excuse, I guess, for me, I don't know other people, but that doesn't give me the excuse to fail being a peer gives me that moment to succeed. And that's what a peer to me is. It's giving those as stories that people say they're stories, but that's true life for me and I've lived it. Some people are coming up to those true low moments and without those moments of, they, they, they need a little, it's not coaching, but they like to know they're not alone. It's knowing that we are out there as peers we have gone through the system and we're willing to listen. And that's about, about where I can stop right at the moment. So um, for, for me, I, I view recovery and the peer support process as a way of life. Um, I went backwards, I got my master's degree, I was introduced into the peer world and something clicked and at the age of 15, I was non-responsive, just going through the motions with major depression, not even knowing what I was or what happened. And, and in the 80s, they didn't really talk about anything. Early 90s, I get medication and I was hospitalized once or twice, not in a state hospital, but for medical reasons, because they, for some, I don't know if it was because I was a young blonde white girl or what, but I didn't go to a hospital traditionally, but it didn't mean that I didn't have that experience. I was on Zoloft for at least 10 years. And I believe that my children's ADD, ADHD, the true versions of them were because a, a result of my own, my own medication that they put on me. Um, my husband, not this one, but my husband died. And my biggest fear was losing my children because of my diagnosis. We can get pulled over. We can be, we can be put in jail because of our diagnosis here, because of the medications that we have. It had, my husband passed away two years before I even met this guy. And for those two years, I was completely paranoid about losing my children while on a medication that I struggled to stay on and, and would feel guilty if I missed a dose because it was one of those two dose things. But it wasn't like one in the morning and one at night. It was one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And I could never remember which one I, which one I forgot to take. And then when I met him and I was, I was in the middle of this, this peer process, he goes, I don't like, I don't like you on medicine. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> and because I'd already been working on, cause I could never remember if I was on it or not. It worked out well that I could, I could be off of it. And I, and I figured it out that the medication, the peer experience, my schooling, everything that I've ever done in my life has made me who I am right now. And I can think clearly and I know when I'm having a good day and when I'm not having a good day, I can be an effective peer support specialist to him as well as to people that I serve because I have that experience. I can relate to people very quickly. Bronwyn, you and I, we've had this conversation. You are my sister and you know it. And many of the things that you were talking about were things that I experienced myself at, at a younger age. Peer support 
is a very valuable thing. And it, and it's just one of these tools that we've learned how to cope with the side effects, the, the withdrawals, the, we we're learning as we go, but it, it, it's a normal for us. It's a, this is who I am. This is a way of life for us. And I really think that that's how peer support can, can help in, in, you know, being, being effective. Thank you both for talking about that. I'm going to shift to Lori because Lori has some experience with peer support groups for people in withdrawal. So can you tell us, cause there's also questions asking, where do people find peer support? Where do people find support for withdrawal? So I think you might be the best person to answer this. Can't hear you. You got to unmute yourself. <laughs> thank you, Angie. And thank you. I'm really grateful for all of you for your interest in act, activity or activism. This is so overwhelming for me, even at, like I came off of Klonopin and a lot of other drugs back in 2004. And it's been a long road of recovery for me. And um, like Johanna shared, it kind of makes you who you are. And Stephanie and others, I would just encourage you to to realize that you may be in for a long haul, but it will be worth it. And you know, we're not the only people that go through things in life. You know, there's all this, these other things like the racism, the CPTSD, the, the PTSD for more, you know, we're just in good company on, as a human race going through things on this planet. Um, as far as peer support, um, you know, I have a website where I try to collect different, um, the different withdrawal groups that I find. Um, the pandemic really put a, a halt to that, um, but a lot of them have moved online. Um, so that's um, warmnetwork.net. Um, you'll find some resources there and, you know, the the in-person and even Zoom withdrawal support groups are few and far between. I think uh, Angie and Laura Delano and the Inner Compass Initiative has some really good things in the works as far as building up this movement of peer support. Um, there are some other things listed there and I've even listed some 12 step groups because there's some real uh, love and acceptance that you can find instead of uh, just being alone. And sometimes you'll see people in those groups who can help you or you can help them. Um, but I, once in a while I go and I look in the site meter for the Warm Network um, website and um, by and large, people are looking for doctors. People want doctors who know how to help you withdraw. And that's not something I can do in a support group setting. I, I give people resources to the doctors that I know of. There are some lists there on the Warm Network website that link to other organizations that keep track of those. Um, I can only give information and I can't tell somebody how to taper. And sometimes people need that. In, in the movie, I noticed that uh, somebody's sitting there shaving her pills and he makes this chart for his wife, which was amazing, right? Like, you know, she supported him through, she was really in it for the long haul. They'd been through some stuff. And here he comes back around and has this chart for her. I thought that was really beautiful, but um, you know, in a perfect world, doctors should be doing that, but they're not um, yet, um, and we can hope and work towards that, um, but that's what people are looking for. I'm not sure a peer support group can do that, but for sure, we can help break the isolation, and if you have interest in starting a group, you know, I'd list it on the Warm Network website. I think we're just, you know, this is our culture just hasn't quite grasped what's going on yet. And um, uh, things like this, which you're putting on today, just help move that along. Um, I'm part of the Holistic Mental Health Network in Cincinnati here. And um, we're thinking about doing the same as you are, 
showing this film for our community uh, because the, the culture just really hasn't caught up but I'm hoping to see this, the, the peer support is amazing. So thank you for- Thank you for sharing that. And I'm gonna to shift to Bronwyn because she has a few uh, few resources for peer support, but I'm thinking we're starting to run out of time, but I wanna hear from the audience. So I'm thinking yes. after Bronwyn shares, I'll share a couple withdrawal resources and then we're gonna do like a lightning round where if you are in the audience and you'd like to share, each person will have about two to three minutes to share and then we'll close. How does that sound? Does that sound and Angie, I would like to share a couple of resources too before Perfect. we do that. Okay, so let's do Bronwyn, Cindy, and then I'll do it and then we'll move on to lightning round. Okay. Sounds great. So um, the kind of talking about the peer support, um, peer support, I've been doing it for 15 years. And this is the reason why I wanted to start the 313 Network Solution is because I saw that in communities such as ours, and Cindy even mentioned it, and a few others mentioned it, we have a fear of ending up in institutions um, and especially being criminalized. There are 2.2 million people in the United States that are in prison, not jail, but prison because of a mental health diagnosis has caused them to commit quote unquote crime and they are not getting help. I was one of those people for eight and a half years. Um, so when I came out, I, I, I realized, and Johanna talked about it, becoming self-aware, realizing who I am, what's my normal, not what everybody else thinks is my normal, but becoming aware of who I am. And I did that on a journey down through uh, peer support. I learned to get self-confident. I learned to understand what is my good days like? What are my bad days like? Um, and I felt that there was a need to have programs where we are mentoring with peer support, people who are transitioning from these institution type settings and helping to educate them and helping them to learn that self-awareness, giving them the tools to put into their treasure chest. So that's what the 313 network is about. And I would love to reach out to young people, youth, youth people and teenagers, high school, because that is where I have heard several people on this panel talk about problems starting in the high school and there was no help, there was no resource. Um, right now, 313 is trying to connect with Miriam Correctional Facility in Ohio to start doing some work with in individuals there because I have a son there and I've already talked to the warden's assistant and we're gonna try to start a podcast called Voices to the Voiceless. Hmm. Last resource I wanna share is there is an organization that developed at the beginning of the pandemic in Oregon and it's called Peer, peergalaxy.com. I think .net or .com, I'm not sure. Um, but they've had over 2 million hits. You can go on there and find support groups all over the country for any time of the day. If it, whether it's NA, AA, peer support, I have a group on there called Time to Reset, which is around um, chakras and meditation and you know uh, the eight dimensions of wellness. So they're, they, they're out there. Um, that's my plug for 313 and Peer Galaxy. Okay, I think Cindy said she had something and then Angie. Yeah, I just want to encourage if people wanna know more about the Soteria House or alternatives to the main psychiatric medical um, systems, I don't know if this is rethinkingpsychiatry.org is an organization that's been in existence for 10 years and we're getting ready to do a big summit in the summer. If you want to contact me, you can contact me at rethinkingpsychiatry at gmail. So just put the gmail instead of the .org. I, I do have a website, but I, won't, I don't want to over whelm you with um, resources. So if you want to know my personal website, my son's story and the advocacy that I do, uh, just write Rethinking Psychiatry and tell them to put you in touch with me. Um, thank y'all for 
being here and listening. And this will be up on the internet so you can share this with other folks. So thank you okay, so much. Andy. All right. So lastly, I'll just say, just go to our website. It's medicatingnormal.com. And we have a resources tab and it shows surviving antidepressants, benzo buddies, Intercompass Initiative, the Withdrawal Project. There's too many to name. So just go to our website. I'll put it there. Okay, let's do the lightning round from the audience. Who has not spoken yet that would like to two or three minutes? Just go ahead and unmute yourself or raise your hand if you're still off camera. I'll speak if nobody else is going to. Um, my name's Janice. Um, I was on psych meds and went through lots of hospitalizations over a period of more than 30 years. Uh, I've been off all meds now for a year and a half. Withdrawal has been hell. I now have tardive dyskinesia, which I was never warned about. Um, I guess the thing that really hit me listening, I think it was Joanna that was talking about losing your kids. I did lose my son when he was 12. I had to, I'd been hospitalized enough times that I had to give up custody to my alcoholic, abusive, pathological liar, ex-husband. And uh, I do have a relationship with my son now, but I can't get back those years that I lost. I can't get back all the other things I lost, my career, myself. Um, but I know who I am now. It's really, really tough going on, but um, I own myself. I own my tears. I own my life. Um, the one thing is I'm listening to everybody that, that I really don't have is any kind of peer support. Uh, these screenings of medicating normal, um, the, the discussions afterwards are, are pretty much all I have in terms of real support. Uh, I have one friend who is mostly supportive, but he's never been on meds, so he doesn't really get it. So um, anyway, uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody, just for being here. Thank you, yeah. It's always good to see you. Thank you. What about Becky or Pankaj? I'm sorry, I'm so, I probably said your name right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Pankaj, and I'm so thankful for everyone. Like, I, I could watch this uh, screening. I've been trying to watch the screening up for so long, but uh, there's always a difference in time zone. And uh, this works for me. Uh, it's still around 11.30 p.m. here. And, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and uh, I, I watched, I was really uh, uh, happy to watch this uh, documentary. I felt like I could relate to this fact that, you know, I've so many years of who I am, who I've become. Like, I, I, uh, before I had a psychotic breakdown, like, uh, I was suffering for a long time, just in silence, and I, for, for a few years, and, and, uh, and, there was no resource and help, and I think the help came with uh, with uh, psychiatry. And and I'm still on uh, on meds, and I'm trying to come off them. And I feel like like I've lost so many years, and not, like not able to have relationships, and I don't know who I am, uh, like who I was before and who I am. I feel emotionally I'm very blunt, and so I think I'm still working on that, and and I'm and I'm in the process is I've took tapered off like uh, uh, half like from 100 mg to 50 mg I'm in this antipsychotic I've joined this support this support group PS, this uh, withdrawal tapering withdrawal group it's run by a psychologist called Olga uh, uh, so that's helpful and um, yeah I mean that's what so much I want to share and um, thanks everyone for sharing and session. Thank you for being here. And just, just, I just want to say, keep going. Don't hurry. It's going to be okay. You're still in there. You're the, who you are is still in there. He'll come out. I promise. How about Becky or anyone else do you want to share? I don't want to coerce you. Please don't. If you, it's sure, up to you. I can. Um, yeah. I know some of the folks on the, on the panel um, here in Michigan. Um, I've been a peer support specialist here and that's how I, I know them. And it has really been like the only saving grace for me for most of my life of being a part of that community. Um, 
I struggled with um, depression from early in childhood. And the thing that it's taken me many, many, many years to realize is that like this Western culture has an inability to live with discomfort, emotional discomfort. And the more I learn about other cultures, um, and unfortunately, because the Western culture has kind of engulfed so much of the world and taken over this very individualistic mentality that pick yourself up by your bootstraps mentality has just infiltrated and taken over everywhere um, to where in communities where people used to have a more collectivist attitude that if something was wrong with someone, it was everyone's problem, that people had to come together to figure it, figure it out, that, that that person in distress was the canary in the coal mine, that it was an indication something was wrong in the community. And now what is just so prevalent and has been for decades is that it's your own fault, deal with it, and you need to go to a professional. And I, I just am so grateful I got the chance to finally see the film. Um, it aligns with things that I have learned over many years now. Um, I myself have been off of med since 2013, but have really been struggling for the last few months and took the plunge and reached out for some support in those traditional ways, just to kind of see what would happen. And I've just kind of done holding the whole process at arm's length, but going through it. And I'm, I'm so glad I got to do this today because it just reaffirmed for me that, you know, um, going down the medication route is of no use to me. It never has been, it didn't help. It caused more problems than ever. Um, but also just seeing that even the people who've adapted, the professionals who've adapted a um, trauma-informed care mindset, they, they don't ask the questions still. Like if you bring it up, they'll say, oh yeah, you should get some support for these things you've been through. But until you bring it up, it's a non-issue and they're just going the drug route of like, oh, you seem like a girl who should be fine. So it must just be this chemical thing and we'll send you over to get drugs for it. Um, and that's not it. Like things aren't always what they look like. So I wish people would just talk to each other more. And I hope that our culture can shift to where we don't have to seek out specific mental health peer support that our our natural communities just grow to have these conversations and be more human with each other again. Maria, you, you're it looks like you're last and then we're going to wrap it up with all the panelists. Beautiful comments, Becky. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Honest to God, you, you guys are real warriors. I'm, I'm coming to you from another angle. I'm a parent who's had a son who's been medicated. And it took me a while and it, it was through you guys that I learned the truth of what was going on. You know, like I, my, myself too, I was just, I couldn't believe it. And now that I've come to see you guys, I, I just, you give me strength. Um, we are trying to withdraw off of some medications and um, like yourself, I, I, I'm like, it's funny because I'm a nurse as well. So I, I, I fed into the system myself. And then when I saw the reality it's, it's like it's shocking. I, I, I just I couldn't believe it. It's so, it's so there. And, the, and yet we're not prepared. They don't, we're not, as, as a health professional, it's because I had to live it to understand what's going on. So my purpose now is really, really, first of all, I'm trying to decrease the medication for my son. And I'm, I'm trying to reach out to different groups because th that's where I get my source. Because sometimes it's very hard. Like as a parent, I, I can reach out to you. I feel what he feels and I feel so guilty because as a health worker, why didn't I see it? Why didn't I see this? Why was I like so many people reading scientific journals and believing what I was been told? Anyway, 
I, I you know, I'm, I'm slowly coming to terms with it. And I, my, my goal is to hope, and I'm doing this a lot in my work. I, I like, you cannot believe how often I tell people, are you sure your family member needs to be on this medication? And I give them, I, I give them the resources that you guys are telling me about. And I'm, um, I'm doing all of this because this is not right. This, it, it, you can't, I, like, I, sometimes I think I'm, I'm living a, uh, a movie that's not true. It's just like, it's unreal. But I re I look at you guys and you guys give me the strength. I really do. And, uh, I, I cannot say more than that. And thank you. Thank you, Angie, for being, for all your work and everybody for your work. It's, I think it will pierce. We will see the end of this. I, I really do believe this. I really do. Because you're reaching out to a lot of people. Thank you again. Maria, oh, that was so beautiful. And I just want to applaud you for listening to your son and hearing him and seeing him and fighting for him. That is so hard when, when everything you've learned goes against that. So just know that you're his hero. Thank God for you. Well, that was a very heavy panel and I feel kind of bad that we didn't get to everybody and that Sh Johanna and Galen, we didn't get to say much or Cheryl, I'm sorry. We could do this another three hours probably, but so let's just, let's just wrap it up. We'll do closing thoughts. So each panelist just go around and give a couple closing thoughts, tell people where to see, where to find you. Um, anything, last words, Cheryl, you go first. Um, yeah, one thing I didn't get to, to topic I didn't get to cover was informed consent. Uh, we really need to get doctors, not just psychiatrists, but medical doctors. I'm going through in the last month and a half, three different medical issues that I have to do my research. You know, I may be done with withdrawal, but I'm in protract protracted withdrawal and every little chemical affects my brain. And right now I'm taking the lesser of three evil and hoping that it works for me um, and that it doesn't start the process over in me. Um, it, it's really hard, but the whole medical and psychiatric community need to know the issues that go on with withdrawal and prescribing. Sure. how about Joanna and Galen? So Galen and I are on uh, a DBSA board and our website's dbsametrodetroit.org. We are holding um, Zoom meetings right now a few times a week. So feel free if you need some extra support to go ahead and join. Um, and that's anybody can join. So we're opening it up to the entire state of Michigan. So why not in the entire state of, of or the entire uh, country? Feel free to, uh, to join our, our Zoom meetings if you need that extra support. Um, but thank you for allowing us this opportunity to, to support you through this process. And I, I don't know what else. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I, I appreciate just being here. Um, you, and, I, and as you can tell, I, I, I hate talking. But what I would like to say is that there are places like drop-ins, uh, clubhouses, uh, bed to bed, uh, multi places, and you can almost find them on the internet like this here. It's the resources and how, how we utilize it. It's uh, this here documentary and thank you for very much. Thank you both. All right, Cindy and then Brown, when you can close us out. Okay, I just want to encourage people to go to rethinkingpsychiatry.org and get on the newsletter because we also have monthly programs beside the big Soteria Respite House Summit that's bringing in um, folks from around the world who are planning to create the alternatives in our community so we can wrap our hands around those, those issues and problems that happen in our society. That picture is a, a hand just embracing depression, pain, suffering. It's like, that's what we need are arms around and not locked doors and medical drugs that, that imprison the mind. So thank you, Angie. And thank you, Bronwyn, for inviting me. And I hope to see you folks at the Rethinking Psychiatry uh, event. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, closing thoughts. Um, Cheryl hit the key thing on the head: informed consent. We as a as a community need to grab a hold to all these resources out here because we just heard about all these resources that people don't know about that are not out here. And as a community, um, we as a community can start educating others, sharing that knowledge, sharing those resources, talking about it because as a community, um, we need to take back our own health, mental yeah. health, physical health. We need to come work at all of these drop-ins, bringing this up. Uh, our respites, you know, learning about that, taking it out of psychiatry because we saw in the film how the drug companies are out here to make money. They don't care who they're harming. They don't care who they're hurting. We as a community have to step up and, and unfortunately, we have to do our research a search. We have to do the education in our community to, and we have to also step up and be mentors and peer support to those who are challenged. You know, I had to step out of being feeling ashamed and guilty and start speaking up uh, and, and, and say, hey, yes, this is who I am today. This is what's going on with me. How can I support you, you know, and being there to listen and being there to listen and help them find an alternative way? Because I've been off medication seven years and I, this is the best I've felt in, in 50. In 50 years, I'm 59 years old and I've struggled. Now I see the light and I want to share and I hope each one of us We'll go out and continue to share in our communities and educate people to get informed consent and not be forced into doing things that may be harmful. My, thank you so much. That's beautiful. My closing thought is something that Doc V says. She's in the film. She says, you know, when you're with a person and they're suffering and maybe they're talking to you about their suicidal thoughts or their depression or whatever, you know, often our society teaches us, you need to get them to a professional. You need to tell them to get help. You need to send them off somewhere. And, and Doc V says, you are that person. You're sitting with them. Yes, That's you. You are, you are that person. So I just hope that um, anybody who's in the audience, everybody who's watching, we just grab onto one person and um, just hold them tight because we're all suffering. We're all in this together. I just love you all. Thank you for being vulnerable today and open and holding this space. I know you filled my cup up, so I appreciate all of you. Almost gonna make me cry. Okay, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you all for joining us. You can get this video on YouTube in about two weeks. And again, all the resources will be in the comment section over there. I'll make sure I copy them and put them over there. Um, if you need it before then, just email us at medicatingnormal at gmail.com and I'll dig them up or ask one of them and get it to you right away. So thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend. All right. Love thank you. Here. Thank you, Bye. Angie. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate yeah. it, you all. Thank you. Bye.